This is uh, Paul Lambert. It is. Oh, hello. Um, I'm writing an important paper, and uh, I heard you were a member of this club called Skull and Bones. I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have a comment on that. Our membership is, uh, is private. The membership is private, and I really can't tell you whether I am or I'm not. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. Oh. But, but maybe you can tell me, how do you get into Skull and Bones? Then? I can't talk about it. Or how did it all start? I can't tell you. Okay. Is there anything you can tell me? Uh, no. Okay. I don't mean to be unfriendly, but that's our policy. It's policy of the organization, and so I really, uh, I, I, I'm not at liberty to, uh, to violate it. Het geheime genootschap Skull and Bones werd in 1832 aan de befaamde Yale Universiteit opgericht. In een tempel op de campus, The Tomb, worden nog ieder jaar 15 nieuwe, zorgvuldig geselecteerde leden geïnitieerd. Well, my interest in this whole question of Skull and Bones came about through a student of mine, a fellow named John Lawrence, a bright student, and he had some ideas, and so I pushed him further to uh, to do serious research and he and I both came to the conclusion very soon that much of the information is uh, not very substantial secret societies don't leave a lot of paper trails behind them that's for sure uh, somebody sent me a package and it was the membership list of skull and bones I'd never heard of skull and bones before and I, I let the package sit maybe two years. This happened about, um, oh, possibly in the late 70s, about 1980. The package arrived. I let it sit because it had no interest to me. And then one day I probably had nothing better to do, so I started thumbing through the list, and I thought, oh, my goodness, th th this is the establishment. Name after name after name, you know, Bush, Bundy, um, uh, Malum, um, uh, Harriman, all these names were coming out of me. It's called the Skull and Bones Society, and members, such as this alumnus we found lurking near the tomb, don't like chatting about their society. No one's going to talk with you. This is a private club. A private club with a long and mysterious history dating back to 1832. It meets inside a building called the tomb. Past members have ranged from President Taft to Secretary of War Stimson. And the more current membership list obtained by American Journal reads like who's who. Is the bones in secret? It includes politicians such as Senators John Chafee of Rhode Island and John Kerry of Massachusetts. Then there's Victor Ashe, the mayor of Knoxville, Tennessee, and columnist Bill Buckley, along with top businessmen and federal judges. So there's nothing to the secrecy except the secrecy. Right. One of the things that happens in consequence of our unwillingness to discuss in detail uh. what it's about that anybody can make up a story and we won't even discuss it. And that, you know, being in the research business, that kind of gets you interested. And I started to piece it together. And uh, I'd heard rumors, you know, as everybody else has, about uh, power structures and establishments within countries. And it was, it was the meshing of, of, of the, 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 these people who had sworn an oath to each other were very powerful and limited to possibly 20 or 30 families of the old Eastern European establishment. That intrigued me, and then bit by bit I began to put the story of the book together, and probably it took me uh, probably three to four years. These people that join organizations such as Bones or the Masons actually leave their family relations uh, that uh, they had when they were children and prolong that intimate family relationship with their brothers from the lodge and they swear to take care of each other's interests and they do it and uh, when that that in the normal conduct of uh, life is probably okay but when one of them becomes president of the united states it's time to ask questions what have you sworn to do for your brothers and what interests are you pushing that are really on their agenda and not on the agenda of the American people? Are there any famous members or well-known members? George Bush. The George Bush? Yeah. But that kind of um, uh, focus is, is not a 
great interest to the members. How do you mean? Because we're much more uh, in, in, interested in the personal uh, issues than, than external achievement. The best known bonesman is ex-president George Bush, who according to tradition is supposed to avoid admitting he's a member, even when the question comes in the Oval Office. Mr. President, are you members still in bones? Okay, you haven't you ever met Bush or Oh yes, he was a couple of years behind me, but I knew I, I, I have met him. What we have here is a private network acting really in violation of the United States Constitution, infesting the White House, the National Security Council, the State Department, the Pentagon, the CIA, and other government uh, institutions. And they've been carrying out a policy which was not the policy of the president or the Congress, uh, not a policy that was approved by the voters. They are still the representatives of a long tradition, thousands, a thousand years tradition, from the Knights Templar through the, uh, uh, the Illuminati, through the Masons, through the uh, Puritan families, uh, and all of those families that went to Yale, founded Yale, and uh, have used Yale to become powerful. Uh, are they done? No. There's uh, all that tradition, and it has to be protected, and it has great wealth to protect. And how do they protect it? They'll find new means. They'll, uh, they'll hold offices. They'll hold appointive offices and elective offices, and they will be uh, uh, in charge of huge amounts of money. Do you know how it all started out so long ago? Uh, I really don't know much about the history of the of the group. No, I don't. Mm. Uh, it's been established for, I think, about 150 years in New Haven uh, by undergraduates and graduates of Yale University. Fifteen members are elected each year. Basically, personal relationships are the most important product of uh, the, the years that you spend in relationship to the organization. Oh, yeah. It's a very personal experience. The core of, of Scott Bones is uh, 15 or 20 families. These are old line uh, families. They came to the United States from England um, about the 1600s, 1700s. And you've got the Lords and the Wadsworths and the, 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 the Bushes. Examples are again the families that made their fortune in the opium trade, and you got to remember the opium trade meant going from India, which was under British domination, to China, where the British were attempting to open up an opium market and indeed fought wars to do that. So these are the families whose family fortunes go back precisely to that kind of of trade. Then you've got a newer element which arose in the 1870s, the money element, like the Harrimans which uh, his father was um, E. H. Harriman, the, the railroad magnet. So the, the core, as you go through the early 20th century, is comprised of 15 or 20 families, partially from old line American families going back to the pilgrims, and partially from money, uh, banking money, that came up through the late 19th century. How do you get into the, this club? Yeah, they, the, ones that were there before choose you. And, and, and what goes on during um, during uh, uh, initiation? Nothing very extraordinary, but it's uh, held very closely. You cannot um, you cannot ask to join Sky and Bones. You can't apply. What happens, uh, as I've pieced it together, is that you are watched. See, this is a senior society. So you're two years at Yale before you're invited to join, if you're going to be invited. There's only 15 members each year. And you're being watched, and you're being uh, catalogued, and you're being assessed. You know, is, is he a good team player? Is he a good sportsman? Um, this kind of thing. And then the previous year, 
members of the PVC decide who is going to be tapped, the 15 new members, and um, then a representative of that, the, the last year's cell goes out and they ask, do you want to, do you want to be uh, tapped or do you want to be joined or not? Al sinds de oprichting van Skull and Bones geldt Tap Day als een belangrijk evenement op Yale. And the, the emissaries of the various secret societies would come up behind them, tap them on the shoulder and say something like, Skull and Bones, do you accept? And generally, of course, they did accept. And then the, uh, as the people were tapped, they then left the courtyard and proceeded to the uh, vault-like or mausoleum-like headquarters of these secret societies. Uh, that, I think, since has been abolished or moved indoors or somehow uh, is no longer so easy to observe as it might have been, say, 50 or 100 years ago. Initiation ceremony. Um, they have the initiation ceremony. Somebody gets dumped naked in a bath of, uh, a bath of mud. Um, well, <laughs> to me, that seems juvenile. And uh, what concerns me is these are the men in which the fortunes and the, the life of the world depend. Uh, th this, is, this is the part that worries me. I mean, whether you want to go around and do that, it's your business. You, know, you can stay in mud all day long, as far as I'm concerned, and bounce of mud. But don't take this man and, and put him in control of world policy, which can bring about war and famine and, and heaven knows what else. This is what worries me. Part of the problem is the source of information. We have very little about uh, bones from the tomb itself, and most comes indirectly, such as an article written by a, a student uh, that went to, uh, to Yale and actually lived in the uh, Jonathan Edwards dorm, and he had this to say. It was part of the Jonathan Edwards folklore that on the April evening following Cap Night at Bones, if one could climb to the tower of Weir Hall, the odd castle that overlooks the Bones courtyard, one could hear strange cries and moans coming from the bowels of the tomb as the 15 newly tapped members were put through what sounded like a harrowing ordeal. Returning alone to my room late at night, I would always cross the street rather than walk the sidewalk that passed right in front of Bones. Even at that safe distance, something about it made my skin crawl. Yes, well, you see, when they become, when they're initiated, I think part of the process is that they are leaving this life and being born into another life. And good and evil is, is part of this duality process. So what really they do is they take a world in which man essentially tries to be good, uh, uh, tries to have good objectives, because basically this is a, the only reason we've survived as humanity is because most of us have good objectives. They've taken that objective and they've reversed it. And they've made their end to be destruction and death. Not death for the 15 in the cell, death for everybody else. That's the meaning behind the symbolism. They seem to stand for the exact opposite of reversal, which is satanic. Skull and Bones is a, is a kind of a Freemasonic association, and I guess you could call it a death cult. You can call it a satanic cult. The symbolism, of course, is the skull and crossbones, right? The death's head or Totenkopf, I guess, as, they, as the SS called it during the Second World War. It's a very sinister symbolism. Uh, it is obviously Freemasonic. Everything about them reflects this, this uh, symbolic, uh, this symbolic hidden meaning. Everything they do reflects a hidden meaning. And uh, um, I mean, I, I can't, I can't, I don't think that these people do these things accidentally or coincidentally. They're intelligent men. They know what they're doing. They know what they're joining. Uh, all I can ask is whether anybody who sees this, would you join an organization which has skull and bones as a symbol? And I think in most cases the answer would be no. Here we have a network of Yale-trained financiers. They're advancing under this pirate flag. They're fresh from their satanic rites, their death cult, uh, and all of the sinister claptrap that they, they have around this. They go into the United States government. They don't care about the president, the Congress, or the Constitution. They take over these institutions and imprint upon them their own policy, which has been tremendously damaging to the United States and the world.
I don't have any members of Bonds who's made any great contribution to literature, to art, to sociology, to anything we might good to might to do to help the world progress and, and be happier. Uh, that's a very interesting thought. They, I mean, they don't just don't show up, say, uh, in the Red Cross or, uh, or in peaceful organizations, except where a peaceful organization is used for an ulterior motive. Um, uh, that uh, that uh, probably is a, a very interesting uh, observation that they, they exist apparently for war and destruction and greed and personal acquisition of finance. They don't exist to better the lot of the fellow men. They, they exist to better their own lot as a group. As is often said, the devil is in the details. What happens after these people leave Yale and become powerful? Een van de bekendere boonsleden uit de geschiedenis is W. Averell Harriman. Hij bekleedde hoge politieke functies onder meerdere presidenten en was de man achter wat nog steeds de grootste privébank van Amerika is, Brown Brothers Harriman. Voor deze bank maakte hij begin jaren 20 in Berlijn contact met de Duitse grootindustrieel Fritz Thyssen. You're almost a decade older now than the century, and I wonder if you could tell us as a starter, Governor, how you maintain this useful appearance of yours. Well, I don't know about that, but I think all one can say is that if you work hard and interested in what you're doing, I think that's the important thing, and then uh, I play hard too, exercise, and uh, uh, I enjoy life. I on looking at the, um, the membership structure, um, one can identify a call. Uh, made up of a number of, as I say, 15 or 20 families. And it appears that at one time, the Harmons were the, 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 the center of this core. Well, we know history does have evidence to show that Harriman gave, uh, through Harriman, money was, uh, uh, was made uh, uh, available to Hitler in his early years, in the early 1930s. And uh, one can ask, how does that relate? Uh, what uh, would be the reason that Harriman would be interested in that? The Union Banking Corporation was established formally in 1924 as a unit in the Manhattan offices of W.A. Harriman and Company, interlocking with the Thyssen-owned Bank für Handel und Schifffahrt in the Netherlands. Rotterdamse Bank voor Handel en Scheepvaart werd gebruikt om via grootindustrieel Fritz Thyssen Hitler en de nazi's van geld te voorzien. Meneer de Dames. Nou, meneer Alder. Yes. Yes, uh, this is Anton Chaitken calling from Washington. Yes. Yes, uh, and uh, they've told me uh, your name and uh, your uh, We're looking at the, um, your position over there. the link between August Tyson Bank in Germany and uh, Union Bank and so Skull and Bones in the United States. Okay, the Union Banking Corporation was um, in New York, uh, controlled by BHS. BHS was in Holland and in Rotterdam, and uh, these were Dutch and German Nazis, on um, it was a, a, a Nazi uh, outlook. And that was a subsidiary of the August Tyson Bank or von Heidt Bank in, in Germany. That, that's the, the, the channel, the conduit, uh, which we're looking. Um, now, the, the Bank for Handel and Schreefvaart, the, uh, the, the is mij wel bekend. I have verschillende, verschillende stukken ervan van gelezen en gezien, maar hij staat beslist niet bekend als een bank waar uh, Ontzettend veel dingen zijn gebeurd die het daglicht niet, uh, niet, konden ver, niet konden verdragen. Then how do we know that this was a, a transfer mechanism? Well, one is that um, we know that August Tyson financed Hitler, or was part of the financing for Hitler. This comes from several sources. Um, and he said he did it through BHS. We know that much. Um, it's more difficult to make the link between BHS and Holland and the Union Banking in the United States. It, it is gewoon een vaststelling van uh, de connecties liggen daar met die en die en uh, dat is het dan. Maar verder uh, 
ja, schurkenstreken, om het zo maar eens te noemen, van die bank die, uh, die zijn voor zover ik weet, zijn ze niet bekend. We do have the conduit, we can prove that. We have the intention and the purpose seem to me to be quite similar between the two groups. And we know that Tyson at one end was financing Hitler and said he, do it, so he did it through BHS, which is halfway down the conduit line. Well, it's, it's that gap between uh, BHS uh, and um, New York that we can't fill in with transfer slips. Yeah, I was reading in uh, Anthony Sutton's books where he discussed the question of the Union Banking Corporation as a Nazi front. And I took that lead to make an inquiry into the United States Justice Department uh, as to what happened to the bank. And turns out, uh, from uh, old timers in the American Justice Department, uh, who were willing to talk, that the U.S. government had acted against the Tyson Bush Harriman Bank and many other enterprises under a certain kind of order called the Vesting Order, very little known today. And I went into the basement of the Library of Congress and pulled out these musty old records showing that the United States government had seized and shut down this Tyson Harriman Nazi banking complex. Now, the, the vesting orders that in America are afgegeven, so uh, late December 41, begin 1942, and then vesting wilde zeggen that the bedrijven under beheer were gesteld. Dat gaat eigenlijk in praktisch al die gevallen om uh, Amerikaanse bedrijven met een grote Duitse invloed of een vermoeden Duitse invloed. En met name dat vermoeden is, uh, vermoeden invloed is belangrijk, want dat wil men op alle mogelijke manieren tegengaan, hè, die Duitse invloeden daarin. Dus uh, neemt men liever uh, 100 bedrijven te veel onder beheer dan, uh, dan eentje te weinig. En de, de achtergrond is eigenlijk een vorm van, van nationale veiligheid, zou je, zou je kunnen zeggen. Want via die, die bedrijven, dus Amerikaanse bedrijven met Duitse invloed, werd er heel vaak spionage gepleegd. Via deze bedrijven kon men inzicht krijgen in de, in de Amerikaanse oorlogsproductie, wat natuurlijk voor de, voor de Duitsers van levensbelang was. En ja, dat is eigenlijk de achtergrond voor al deze vesting orders die er zijn afgegeven. Ja, yeah, but this avoids the problem that there are two classes of Nazi collaborators. One would be somebody who is a German who thinks he's acting in the, on the side of Germany in a war, some ordinary German. Then you have big financiers, uh, big money people, people in politics and in diplomacy, people in the DuPont and Rockefeller and Harriman companies and their collaborators in the richest companies in Germany at the highest levels of German society. When, when the United States government took out vesting orders against the richest people in Germany and New York, that's different from the incidental picking up of some Germans who may have been in the German-American Bund. These are very important. That's why the vesting orders against Thyssen, DuPont, and Rockefeller are the most important ones done by the American authorities during the war. 42, yeah. But uh, still the point is that I, I, I can't believe why English and uh, American capitalists should support Hitler in 1922. That's what you started with, wasn't it? Uh, but, okay, let's, uh, let's change books. That's Terrific. That's a good idea. Okay, thanks very much. I'll talk to you again. Okay, okay. thank you. Bye-bye. So, I mean, he has nothing to say in opposed to what we're doing. Because he doesn't know about American industry, he doesn't know about American finance, he doesn't know about these people who did these things. And the issue uh, for the American government was Harriman and his relationship to Tiffin, or at least the Harriman Bank and its relationship to Tiffin. He knows nothing about that. But don't you think he should know? Yes, he should. It is amazing that he doesn't. Uit originele documenten van het in Amsterdam gevestigde Internationaal Instituut voor Sociale Geschiedenis blijkt wel degelijk de onderlinge samenhang tussen de Bank voor Handel en Scheepvaart, de August Thiessen Bank van Fritz Thiessen en Harriman's Union Banking Corporation. The investigators concluded 
that the Union Banking Corporation has, since its inception, handled funds chiefly supplied to it through the Dutch bank by the Thyssen interests for American investment. So here is Averill Harriman and Prescott Bush, the leaders of the bank in Manhattan, working with uh, Fritz Thyssen. They, in the Skull and Bones network in the United States, around Harriman, are pro-fascists, and they're working with uh, Thyssen and others establishing a money link to support the backers and sponsors of Adolf Hitler from at least 1924, probably 1923 onwards. I didn't know about this. There's your link right there. There's your link. Established in 1924 in the Manhattan office of W.A. Hammond. So it is the same thing I said. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That was the time that Hitler was looking for money. So Emil Kurdoff, I didn't know he was looking so. That's it. That, 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 that's the clinching link. It's, uh, I think it's a reasonable supposition that money followed from that, even if I don't have the translation. Here on the Black Sea, near the city of Yalta in the Crimea, is the meeting place of the leaders of Britain, Russia, and the United States scene of the most successful international conference of the war. Anthony Eden, British Foreign Minister. And Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain. Marshal Joseph Stalin, Premier of the Soviet Union. Edward Stettinius, with Averill Harriman, United States Ambassador to Russia. Averill Harriman's father was put into business running railroads by, with money from the royal family of England. He was their nominee. And then Averill Harriman's mother paid for the start of the American branch of the British eugenics movement. He established this, what we call today, fascist movement in America, uh, the Eugenics Record Office, originally set up uh, around 1909 by Averill Harriman's mother. I, I know, I've said, there's a New York Times article on the Eugenic Society, founded by Mrs. Averill Harriman. She financed it. And um, uh, its policy was to, how can I put it, to not rid the world, that's too strong, is to um, discourage undesirables. And then who are the undesirables? Well, it's pretty, uh, pretty much it comes out, as I remember reading the article, that there were there were certain unfortunate people, not as well off as others, which, uh, which I suppose would include blacks and Jews, and it was a racial, it's a racial thing. The Eugenic Society was racial. Where, where the Harrimans created this American branch of that movement, then it was moved as a headquarters to Yale University, where the American Eugenics Society had its headquarters. And so you've got this racial policy financed by Mrs. Harriman, the mother of the two Bonesmen. Her husband was a Bonesman, her two sons were Bonesmen. So she gets kind of caught up in this thing. The uh, aristocrats from England, the aristocrats from the so southern United States combined to place at Yale University this kind of ultra-aristocratic club dedicated to eliminating equality in, in the world, dedicated to subverting our government and its original mission of man's equality instead of uh, their point of view, which is the uh, racist domination of Anglo-Saxons over all other uh, groups in the world. The film Erbkrank, one of the propaganda instruments of the Nazis. Ernst Rudin, who wrote 
Hitler's race laws in 1933 was in the American Museum of Natural History at the uh, Harriman Run Conference in 1932 of the eugenics movement for the world. He was elected leader of the world movement there at that Harriman meeting and went immediately back to Germany. Hitler was put into power within a few months and Rudin was put in charge of writing these race laws that said if Jews mix with Aryans, uh, they're going to be punished. This, this idea of a racial policy um, is, I think, just as important as the financial link. I mean, sure, you can, you can hand over a million marks, but if a policy is as important as a racial policy, the one of extermination it came down to, also continue, then you're right back to the same group. And one can go further, right up to today, and ask questions about, um, about these racial policies. For example, um, I, was, uh, I read Robert McNamara. McNamara used to be Secretary of Defense in the United States. He's not a bunch man, but he's uh, one of the so-called whiz kids. Um, if, if you read uh, uh, McNamara's latest book, you will find that he says that population expansion is more, uh, is more dangerous than atomic warfare. They still have the same point of view about cutting the budget and getting rid of whole classes of people that are superfluous in their view, the elderly or people of the wrong race. And this is their point of view today. I, George Herbert Walker Bush. I, George Herbert Walker Bush. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Als we willen weten wat het gedachtegoed van Skull and Bones tegenwoordig is, moeten we kijken naar de persoon van George Bush. Na William Taft, het tweede lid van Skull and Bones dat Amerikaans president wordt. Hij wordt hier ingezworen door Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, ook Skull and Bones lid. Uh, with Bush, we, we reached the bottom of the barrel in terms of American politicians. You have to look at him again and again and say, how did this guy make it? compared to any number of other political figures that would have been perfectly plausible presidential candidates. You've got to point to the family money, again to this Brown Brothers Harriman network, which meant media, which meant uh, friendships with senators, ultimately it meant the support of Kissinger, that brought the support of Nixon. Uh, at every critical turn in Bush's career, he was often defeated. He was again defeated in, in his Senate uh, attempts in 64, in 1970, but he was always then getting appointments from people like Kissinger and Nixon so that he could somehow keep going and try to make this uh, bid for the top, for the vice presidency, and then after that somehow slither into the presidency based on uh, the fact that many people in 1990, in 1988, many people, especially in the southern states, were really voting for Reagan because they thought this was going to be a continuity uh, of the Reagan years, which they had found... Uh, perhaps uh, tolerable. There's a certain stability to our system, and uh, I think experience taught me project that stability. Don't uh, go for the grandstands. Don't, uh, don't over-dramatize things. The American people are entitled to know that the system works, that experienced people know how to handle the moments of crisis. You've got an example of Bush. Uh, Bush, the Bush family, of course, has been a long time in Skull and Bones. Um, Bush is one year ambassador to China, one year in the Central Intelligence Agency, then he becomes vice president, then president. Now, he covers so much ground, you know, so quickly, that, and he's not, a, he's not an abnormal genius or anything, uh, but there had to be pressure and a power play behind the scenes. When you look at, it, at uh, incidents like this, and there are many of them, you cannot arrive at any other conclusion that behind the scenes there's some pushing and pulling and, uh, and almost manipulation to advance. And advance is the word used by many, many members um, within Skull and Bones. They advance their interests. Um, we can certainly say that George Bush, in his political career, which reaches back into the 1950s, uh, is a suitable metaphor to express the power of these Skull and Bones Harriman networks in modern American life. And it's also the case that George Bush brings together as a kind of a nodal point all of the different components that, that uh, are involved in the Skull and Bones and also in other allied pro-British political currents inside the United States. 
And who should sit at that desk? My friend, I am that man. When Bush was in the Congress, he brought in what amounts to a raving racist, really indistinguishable from a Nazi eugenics or Nazi race scientist, so-called, this man Shockley, and gave him the respectability of being able to address a group of members of the United States Congress. The argument then always being the bad genes are multiplying too fast. Everybody knew this meant blacks. The good genes are not multiplying fast enough. This meant Anglo-Saxons and maybe other whites, if they're lucky, right? In het zuiden van Californië, bij de stad San Diego, wordt in een ondergrondse bunker diep gekoeld op deze boerderij het zaad bewaard van twee Nobelprijswinnaars en drie andere donors. Miljonair Robert Graham heeft hen uitgekozen om samen met jonge intelligente vrouwen een superras te kweken. Graham, die geschrokken van de publiciteit geen interviews geeft, heeft al tien jaar geleden een boek geschreven waarin hij een beroep doet op intelligente mensen om hun sperma af te staan en zo te zorgen voor een nieuw superras. De enige donor die er rond vooruit wil komen dat hij al twee maal zaad heeft gegeven, is de uitvinder van de transistor, Nobelprijswinnaar Dr. William Shockley. Dr. Shockley, why did you give sperm to this exclusive uh, bank for Nobel laureates? Well, for a long time I've been interested uh, not only in the human quantity problem, that is the population explosion that exists worldwide, but also in the human quality problem. In fact, what it is doing is offering more choice and more freedom. Do you think that um, the white race is superior? I would think that the black population, there's no doubt in terms of performance, intellectual performance, the black population is much lower than the white. And furthermore, as I have stressed, the highest birth rate that I found in the 1970 census applies to the lowest socioeconomic segment of the black population, rural black farm women. They average 5.4 children enough to double their fraction of the population in one generation. Mm -hmm. That should be compared to breeding of racehorses and dogs. The same laws apply. And therefore, said Shockley, what we ought to do is use sterilization, allegedly voluntary sterilization, but everybody knows that voluntary sterilization becomes forced sterilization if that's the price of getting your welfare check or, or some other thing that you need to survive from the government. And therefore, Shockley said, if we can prevent the bad genes from multiplying faster, we'll keep the gene pool intact because then the, then the good genes will multiply more slowly. You see, if you really believe, as Bush does, that there's an Anglo-Saxon master race, and this is what Harriman believed, and this is one of the core beliefs, I would say, of Skull and Bones, if you believe that there's an Anglo-Saxon master race that ought to rule the world, the big problem you have is that there are so few Anglo-Saxons. They see these people as a threat to their life, and they want to get rid of them. Overpopulation means uh, uh, getting rid of the people at the bottom of the scale, not at the top. Opmerkelijk in dit verband was een bezoek aan Dr. Stephen Mumford, auteur van meerdere boeken over overbevolking. Boeken die de aandacht trokken van onder andere George Bush. Early in the year, maybe February or April. I met with George Bush in his office in Houston just after he left the CIA. And I had been doing research of a similar nature there in, in Houston and had written a book uh, on overpopulation as a national uh, security threat. I presented a two-page synopsis of that book to George Bush in his office in Houston. He, uh, Bush uh, read the two-page synopsis, which concluded that overpopulation is the gravest threat to U.S. security, even more serious than the nuclear threat. And at that point, George Bush said to me, I agree with everything you're saying here in the synopsis, and I can assure you that people at the CIA agree with you too. That the CIA inderdaad bezig was met deze materie, blijkt uit dit rapport, waarvan tot voor kort maar één exemplaar bestond. There was only one copy of this, and it was kept under lock and key. It's a very interesting story. Uh, the agencies involved were the National Security Council, the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, Department of Defense, Department of State, uh, and the Agency for International Development. Where population size is greater than available resources, 
or is it expanding more rapidly than the available resources? I mean, this is the one that says why it's a security threat or how it becomes a security Where population size is greater than available resources or is expanding more rapidly than the available resources, there is a tendency toward internal disorders and violence and sometimes disruptive international policies or violence. This is what happened with Iraq and, and uh, Kuwait. In developing countries, the burden of population factors added to others will weaken unstable governments, often only marginally effective in good times, and open the way to extremist regimes. Volgens Manfred is overbevolking er de oorzaak van dat jaarlijks miljoenen Mexicanen de grens met de Verenigde Staten proberen over te komen. Uh, we share a 2,000 mile border with Mexico. When you share a 2,000 mile border with a country of 90 million people who are going to war, civil war, how many tens of millions are going to come across our border? And what is this going to do to the security of, of Americans? I mean, here in Chapel Hill even, I mean, we, we're going to feel the effect in a big way. I mean, the, the odds of this happening, if, if we just ignore the situation, the odds of it happening are nearly 100 percent. You know, the half of Mexicans now eat 1,300 calories per day or less. That's the minimum requirement. So half of all Mexicans are malnourished. Well, things are only going to get worse. They're not going to get any better. And so what does this mean for U.S. security? Hell, it means everything. On an August day in 1988, an historic event took place. It didn't happen on Main Street or in any American town, but in Russia, where soldiers began destroying hundreds of nuclear missiles with the understanding that we'd destroy some of our own, the first disarmament treaty of its kind. And though most Americans were unaware of the significance of the moment or realized it was George Bush who led the way, someday their grandchildren will. Uh, uh, President Bush was elected, and we had hoped that he would be uh, I mean, would offer much, much more leadership in this area than President Reagan, because we knew that uh, he had, had at one time strong feelings about family planning. In fact, he was one of the leaders in Congress as a congressman in this area. So yes, you can see, you can see this racial, this racial uh, ideas which go back to Harlan and the Nazis. You can see them being continued and perpetuated today. Aflevering 2 over Skull and Bones gaan we dieper in op wat bekend is geworden als The Enterprise, de massale drugsimporten door de CIA in opdracht van George Bush. These purple colored hash marks represent what's called a military operations area or an MOA. Uh, so that pro provided a blanket of security and made it a real good reason, a uh, good place to run drugs, uh, remote under radar surveillance for the most part if you're below 4,000 feet out here not a lot of questions asked and uh, they got away with it Skull and Bones blijkt deel te zijn van een groter geheel een andere organisatie waar wij in dit verband aandacht van besteden is de Bohemian Club in San Francisco I'm sorry, where's your property line? I'm not sure Where's the property line? I'm not sure. So this is a public street, right? Right here? This crosswalk? Oh, that's fine. Move. You understand move? You're not very racist. You're our private property. Private building, private sidewalk. Well, okay. We got the hospitality, the negative hospitality, the San Francisco Bohemian Club. Is this uh, Paul Lambert? It is. Oh, hello. Um, I'm writing an important paper, and uh, I heard you were a member of this club called Skull and Bones. I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have a comment on that. Our membership is, uh, is private. The membership is private, and I really can't tell you whether I am or I'm not. <laughs> Are you serious? 
Ja. Het geheime genootschap Skull and Bones werd in 1832 aan de befaamde Yale Universiteit opgericht. In een tempel op de campus, The Tomb, worden nog ieder jaar 15 nieuwe, zorgvuldig geselecteerde leden geïnitieerd. Vandaag, aflevering 2. Well, Skull and Bones is a, is a kind of a Freemasonic association. And I guess you could call it a death cult. You can call it a satanic cult. The symbolism, of course, is the skull and crossbones, right? The death's head or totenkopf, I guess, as, they, as the SS called it during the Second World War. It's a very sinister symbolism. Uh, it is obviously Freemasonic. Everything about them reflects this, this uh, symbolic, uh, this symbolic hidden meaning. Everything they do reflects the hidden meaning. These people that join organizations such as Bones or the Masons actually leave their family relations uh, that uh, they had when they were children and prolong that intimate family relationship with their brothers from the lodge. And they swear to take care of each other's interests and they do it. And uh, when uh, that, that in the normal conduct of uh, life is probably okay, but when one of them becomes president of the United States, it's time to ask questions. What have you sworn to do for your brothers? And what interests are you pushing that are really on their agenda and not on the agenda of the American people? Are there any famous members or well-known members? George Bush. Lee George Bush. But that kind of uh, uh, focus is, is not of great interest to the members. How do you mean? Because we're much more uh, in, in interested in the personal uh, issues than, than external achievement. The best known bonesman is ex-president George Bush, who according to tradition is supposed to avoid admitting he's a member even when the question comes in the Oval Office. Mr. President, I'll give him a skull and bone. Okay, you ever, you ever met Bush or...? Oh, yes, he was a couple years behind me, but I knew I, I, I have met him. Hmm. The core of, of skull and bones is uh, 15 or 20 families. These are old line uh, families. They came to the United States from England. Um, about the 1600s, 1700s. And you've got the Lords and the Wadsworths and the, 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 the Bushes. Then you've got a newer element which arose in the 1870s, the money element, like the Harrimans, which uh, his father was um, E. H. Harriman, the, the railroad magnate. So the, the core, as you go through the early 20th century, is comprised of 15 or 20 families partially from old line American families going back to the Pilgrims, and partially from money, uh, banking money, that came up through the late 19th century. On looking at the, um, the membership structure, um, one can identify a core uh, made up of a number, as I say, 15 or 20 families, and it appears that at one time, the Harmons were the, 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 the center of this core. Een van de bekendere boonsleden was W. Averell Harriman, jarenlang actief in hoge politieke functies onder meerdere presidenten. In zijn functie als Amerikaans ambassadeur in de Sovjet-Unie was hij aanwezig bij de conferentie van Yalta, februari 1945. Prime Minister of Great Britain. Marshal Joseph Stalin, Premier of the Soviet Union. Edward Stettinius, with Averill Harriman, United States Ambassador to Russia. I think this is a story of skull and bones. Many men, I won't say all of them by any means, uh, have this lust for power. And uh, that, I suppose, is the basis of skull and bones, is a lust for power. Today, it, uh, the Harriman family doesn't exist anymore. It's the Bush family because you've got Bush, um, who was vice president and president, and you've got his two sons, governors of two states, Florida and Texas. Jeb is gouverneur from Florida, and George Jr. is nu nog gouverneur van Texas. Het is zeer waarschijnlijk dat hij zich kandidaat stelt voor het presidentschap. 
Vragen over zijn lidmaatschap van Skull and Bones weet hij behendig te ontwijken. Zoals hier tijdens een persconferentie. Does it still exist? Um, the thing is so secret, I'm not even sure it still exists. Record that as the most unusual question I've ever been asked in my entire clip. <laughs> so you can identify a core within the Bush family and also within the Lord family. And then you've got some other very interesting um, elements. Uh, Kerry, Senator Kerry, for example, a very influential man in the Senate as a member of Skull and Bones. And another interesting senator was Senator Bourne, B-O-R-E-N, from Oklahoma, who was chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is a very sensitive post. He was Skull and Bones. Now, if you take men like um, Lord, uh, Bush, uh, Bourne, and Kerry, just those four men, you can control an awful lot of policy just with those four positions. You don't need very much else. You're covering intelligence. You're covering broad policy creation. And come in the political aspect and on the floor on the sun. Just as four and the minimum in the others. We can certainly say that George Bush, in his political career, which reaches back into the 1950s, uh, is a suitable metaphor to express the power of these skull and bones Harriman networks in modern American life. Op zijn 18e verjaardag, Amerika was kort daarvoor in de Tweede Wereldoorlog verzeild geraakt, gaf hij zich op voor de marine. Hij vocht als piloot tegen de Japanners, vloog met een bommenwerper naar de omstreden eilanden in de Stille Oceaan, werd neergeschoten en gewond en kreeg in 1945 een hoge onderscheiding. Daarna studeerde de bankierszoon economie aan de Universiteit van Jail. Met een diploma op zak ging hij in zaken. Hij begon een bedrijfje in olieboormaterialen. In 1966 stapte hij over naar de politiek. Hij verkocht zijn bedrijf en hield daar genoeg aan over om nooit meer krap te hoeven zitten. Bush kwam in het huis van afgevaardigden, verloor de strijd om een senaatzetel voor Texas van Lloyd Benson en werd in 1970 voor Nixon ambassadeur bij de Verenigde Naties. Later zat hij ook nog ruim een jaar voor Richard Nixon in China. George Bush was voorts nog enige jaren directeur van de CIA en voorzitter van de Republikeinse Partij. Hij is dus zeer ervaren in de politiek en in het management. You cannot arrive at any other conclusion that behind the scenes there's some pushing and pulling and, uh, and almost manipulation to advance. And advance is the word used by many, many members um, within Skull and Bones. They advance their interests. Uh, what I tried to do was to, to look at Bush and say, is there anything good? Can you find an act of disinterested kindness? Can you find any humanitarian impulse? And I'm afraid the answer is no. What you find is dissembling. You find pre somebody pretending to care about charity or somebody else's suffering or misery. But this is, these are usually tricks performed in front of the camera for electoral reasons or some other demag demagogic kind of strategy. On an August day in 1988, an historic event took place. It didn't happen on Main Street or in any American town, but in Russia, where soldiers began destroying hundreds of nuclear missiles with the understanding that we'd destroy some of our own, the first disarmament treaty of its kind. And though most Americans were unaware of the significance of the moment, or realized it was George Bush who led the way, someday their grandchildren will. You have to look at him again and again and say, how did this guy make it compared to any number of other political figures that would have been perfectly plausible presidential candidate. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. The first echt grote politieke role van George Bush was zijn positie als vicepresident van Ronald Reagan. In de aanloop daarnaartoe hielp hij Reagan in uiterst turbulente tijden aan de macht te komen. Do you really think Iranian terrorists would have taken Americans hostage if Ronald Reagan were president? Do you really think the Russians would have invaded Afghanistan if Ronald Reagan were president? Do you really think third-rate military dictators would laugh at America and burn our flag in contempt? If Ronald Reagan were president, isn't it about time we had the strong new leadership Ronald Reagan would provide as president? Acht jaar later steunde Reagan met succes zijn vicepresident 
in de wedloop om het nieuwe presidentschap. America needs the strength, the vision and the true grit of George Bush. There's a certain stability to our system. And uh, I think experience taught me project that stability. Don't uh, go for the grandstands. Don't, uh, don't over-dramatize things. The American people are entitled to know that the system works, that experienced people know how to handle the moments of crisis. Where I go into it, uh, into the mindset or joint operation between Bush and the CIA would be the uh, and the October Surprise. And the October Surprise was a scheme involving people uh, in the CIA and in both uh, high-level uh, uh, government, both political parties. This is when President uh, Carter was, when Carter was president. And this is a time when there were 52 American hostages seized and uh, imprisoned in uh, Iran. And it was felt as the presidential election was coming up uh, between President Carter and uh, challenger Reagan that if Carter was able to get the release of these American hostages before the election, that Carter would probably be reelected. So the CIA and George Bush, at that time a private citizen, uh, but undoubtedly an asset of the CIA, they engaged in a scheme to prevent the release of those American hostages. And there were a number of secret hearings, which I describe again in Defrauding America. And these hearings, these meetings occurred in Europe and different places. And eventually, $40 million was paid to our, uh, Iranians, and they were promised billions of dollars of military equipment if they don't release the hostages. Well, the hostages were not released and the arms did flow, and this, uh, this eventually led to what uh, became known as our Iran-Contra affair. Terrorists be aware that when the rules of international behavior are violated, our policy will be one of swift and effective retribution. Ronald Reagan, in the first week he was elected president five years ago, he was addressing the hostages who'd been held for a year in Tehran by Shiite Muslim supporters of the Ayatollah Khomeini. The Iran hostage crisis had helped make Ronald Reagan president. It finished Jimmy Carter and had provided Reagan with his strongest election campaign platform. Uitstukken van het Huis van Afgevaardigden dat onderzoek heeft gedaan naar de October Surprise blijkt dat president Carter op de hoogte was van de onderhandelingen door Bush met de Iraniërs, maar er verder geen aandacht aan wilde besteden. Hij heeft ook nooit bewijzen willen verzamelen. Carter wil de schone handen houden. I'll never tell a lie. I'll never make a misleading statement. I'll never betray the confidence that any of you has in me. And I will never avoid a controversial issue. Well, the secret government, uh, I think, would be a proper term to be uh, applied to uh, what I discovered about the corruption in the CIA corruption in the Justice Department. The Justice Department and CIA corruption, seem that they seem they work very closely together. And they have to more or less to get away with what they've done. 2.2, altimeter 3050. Visual approach is in use, landing and deploying with light 4. That's perfect. Alpha all the way down to the south end of the field. Alpha 393, just hold I'm a former Air Force Intelligence Officer from the Vietnam War. Uh, I made a lot of connections. Uh, connections that kept drawing me into covert operations act after my discharge from the Air Force. Uh, one of those uh, operations that I was drawn into voluntarily was uh, the so-called Enterprise. The Enterprise was a black bag operation set up by the Reagan-Bush administration designed to assist the Contras in Nicaragua. So I was brought in by Oliver North to meet a man named Barry Seal. And Barry Seal was the person who I viewed as the, the, the chief operative, the man who had the contract, so to speak, from the CIA to set up a clandestine 
training base in a place called Mena, Arkansas. As you uh, fly over the Mena airport in town, what jumps out at you is the, uh, the degree of uh, infrastructure that exists at the Mena airport in relationship to a small town of 5,000 people. You see a row of hangars, huge buildings uh, on the west side of the north-south runway. This yellow area denotes Little Rock, Arkansas. Coming west, we'll find Hot Springs. That's Bill Clinton's hometown. And we go about 60 nautical miles further and we'll find Mina. This is the town and there's the airport. It wasn't until uh, nearly 18 months into the Contra program, uh, the training program, that I discovered and came face-to-face uh, -face with irrefutable knowledge that uh, I was right in the middle of a large cocaine importation ring. I first discovered the drug trafficking by the CIA while I was an airline pilot flying in Tokyo and flying in the Middle East. But then, uh, when I was a federal investigator holding authority to make these determinations, I discovered other forms of government, uh, of government corruption. And more I, I persisted in trying to expose this. But, the more people that became involved through cover-up, it would be federal judges in the United States, Congress, other checks and balances. And then about 10 years ago, I started becoming a confidant to people who were actually flying the drugs for the CIA or the DEA, flying arms to Central America, let's say, and flying drugs back. Uh, people who helped set up the Medellin and Cali cartel who were with the CIA. Okay, here's a declaration that uh, Gene Tatum um, prepared for me at my request, and it describes some of the things that he had seen, and uh, he's describing how he reported to his handlers in the CIA and the National Security Council, including William Barr, Oliver North, George Bush. And he's talking about uh, the drug smuggling that he witnessed uh, as a, a military pilot and also um, as a CIA pilot. Okay, this here is one of many flight plans that Tatum gave to me. And on the back of the flight plan, in his own handwriting, he made comments about the flight. And this is the one where uh, they met with George Bush at a location in Central America, and they met at a German restaurant where they were talking the drug-related uh, drug smuggling activities. The value of these documents is that it uh, gives credibility to my sources and also to what they're telling me. Colored hash marks represent what's called a military operations area, or an MOA. Uh, so that pro provided a blanket of security and made it a real good reason, uh, good place to run drugs, uh, remote, under radar surveillance for the most part. If you're below 4,000 feet out here, not a lot of questions asked, and uh, they got away with it. Uh, you have people um, in control of the DEA that are all part of this. And what they're doing is uh, undermining, financially and morally undermining the United States and the American people. And of course, what, uh, what they are doing also affects people in other countries. Can you see that big knot on that mountain up there? On the other side of that was our secret training base and our, our covert airstrip. We had a sod runway built up there that we used as a practice drop zone 
to drop supplies. Uh, pilots were taught uh, short field landing techniques and all that, the type of runways that they would experience in Nicaragua, in Nicaragua not having many paved runways, especially uh, behind enemy lines. But uh, at night, you could see the planes coming back from, uh, from Nicaragua. Um, and the ridges over here is where you would first pick up the landing lights. And when that would happen, there would be a flurry of activity here on the flight line as uh, big propeller-driven military cargo planes would come lumbering into this small little sleepy town and, uh, and wake up the, uh, the local inhabitants. It's hard to say how much cocaine was transported into Mina during the uh, Contra War, but one individual, Barry Seal, who ran the operation, was uh, granted immunity by Congress to testify about what had gone wrong. And during that testimony, with immunity, uh, Barry Seal said that he had personally flown in more than uh, 20 tons of cocaine into this airport. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of cocaine. And that's just from one individual. And there were multiple pilots. Uh, Barry was not the only pilot flying weapons to the counters and bringing drugs back. Uh, there was no way I accepted that Bill Clinton didn't know about this. Uh, Barry Seal told me that the Clinton government was actually in on it, quote unquote. But Bill Clinton was a was a necessary element. Um, you know, anytime you have a third world environment, you always have a dictator at the top, and that was that was Bill's role. Uh, he was a young governor uh, that would do anything for power and money. Uh, he, would, he was also, uh, according to various sources, intelligence sources, Bill Clinton has had a relationship with the CIA going back to his days in, at least as early as Oxford, uh, perhaps even before that. But uh, I can say this. Arkansas welcomed this operation with open arms, did absolutely nothing to inter interfere with it, and benefited tremendously. I had some genuine legal concerns. As I, as I aired those concerns with North, Oliver North, uh, he assured me to put those concerns aside because this was being run out of the White House by George Bush. That had been decided among the, the people in charge, and that would have been Ronald Reagan, uh, CIA Director William or Bill Casey, and George Bush, that Bush had uh, the, the best background. To, to pull this off, a former director of the CIA, a man who had been in the military himself, and a person that, uh, that I think uh, history will eventually show had no moral boundaries to what he would to what he would do. Uh, I felt assured in 1983 that George Bush was a man of honor, and I felt that I could uh, step back into the shadows, so to speak, and, and do what my country re requested, and I did. There are hazards involved in attempting to bring out uh, the uh, misconduct of the secret government. Now, in my case, for instance, uh, I think I, I've been, been through about 30 years of the retaliation by the U.S. government. First, while I was a federal investigator, they make it very difficult for you when you report the uh, misconduct that you, run in, uh, well, that you uh, encounter. Then when I started to expose the other misconduct, the CIA and what have you, then they, uh, they uh, to, uh, by having control of the, federal, of the courts and other agencies, uh, they put me into a position whereby they seized all of my assets. These are done, uh, this is done in violation of law. And um, at one time, I was quite well off. I was a multimillionaire, and I I had a silly um, I had a silly um, uh, feeling that I had an obligation 
to report these things, and um, uh, they seized everything I had, my airplanes, my businesses, my home, and uh, if they had their way, I'd be homeless now. Uh, many of the players of the Nina story in the Enterprise are, are dead, uh, Barry Seal in particular. But uh, it's, a, it's a risky business, and uh, those who, who feel that they want to have an action-packed career for the CIA should, uh, should think twice before they uh, get deeply involved. Finally, in 1978, I thought, well, I will publish books to make the public aware of these things, and there I had the naive thought that the public would uh, respond. But the public doesn't respond, and uh, so in a way, the, the public is uh, partly responsible for what is going on, and some people might even say the public deserves what uh, is happening to them. Uh, we needed uh, cooperation by the FBI. We need cooperation by the U.S. military, uh, FAA, U.S. Customs, DEA. I mean, the list goes on and on of the state, federal, and local agencies who had to either uh, assist in providing security for the enterprise or they had to at least turn a blind eye to it. Het Amerikaanse congres liet een onderzoek verrichten naar Mina en bevestigde in haar conclusies de drugsimporten door de CIA. Het onderzoek werd geleid door senator John Kerry, een Skull and Bones lid. Het woord Bush komt in het hele rapport niet voor. George Bush was not out of the loop, as he, his famous statement was throughout the, these four or five years we're discussing. Uh, George Bush, George Bush uh, had his hands in every facet of this thing. Skull and Bones is deel van een groter geheel, van een systeem van organisaties dat achter de schermen opereert en waarin de machtigste en meest invloedrijke mensen vertegenwoordigd zijn. In de schaduw van de democratie besluit de elite de rijen. Well, George Bush to me personifies American elitism. And it, uh, this can be recognized uh, to some extent through uh, three organizations which are not controlled by Skull and Bones, but which, which reflect the Skull and Bones influence again through George Bush. And one, of course, is the Bohemian Grove, which uh, has a parallel in that it, it seems to uh, admire uh, blood and destruction, as Skull and Bones does, through its, uh, through its, um, um, its uh, ritual built about Moloch, the god of war. Secondly, uh, the Council of Foreign Relations, which had as a long-time chairman, uh, Winston Lord, also a bondsman, and through the Troy Lennon Commission, which although it is an international organization representing three regional groupings, um, still uh, reflects, reflects the ideas of George Bush. It's an elitist organization. I think that's what is important. Here you've got a, in each of these three organizations, organizations, you have a group that sees itself as superior to all others within society. And I think that is the element which is carried over from Skull and Bones into these organizations, this superiority. We're standing at Post and Taylor in San Francisco at the uh, San Francisco Bohemian Club. This was completed in 1934 at the heights of the Depression. And they spent a great deal of money building this elab elaborate um, organization here. So the, the motto of the club is weaving spiders do not enter and it's right here on the wall. This is the, uh, the owl and um, the plaque uh, commemorating when the, the building was first built. But what this implies is that we're not, you know, people coming here are not supposed to do business. So there's no overt business solicitation, but for years uh, various businesses in the community and corporations would have meetings here, official meetings, receptions, and um, various events. I got interested in studying elites um, back basically in the 1980s um, because I've been a social worker for 25 years working with poor people and low-income families in the United States. And I became very concerned why there was, this would seem to be a perpetual problem. We have over 30, 40 million people who just cannot meet their basic needs in the United States, yet we have more wealth in this country um, than we've ever had. 
and that wealth is very concentrated in the top 1% of the population, which in fact uh, has more wealth than 90% of the rest of us. So I wanted to understand how wealthy individuals and elites um, uh, interacted, set policies, uh, worked with the government, um, financed elections, and made decisions. And so that's basically how I got started and interested in, in elite work. Elitism is not in the interests of the average citizen. It's not in the spirit of a free society. And it's very dangerous because was it, that Lord Acton who said power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, when you've got power, it begins to corrupt you. You think you're God. You think you can make decisions for other people. And then gradually it eats away, I think, at these people until they become dictators. And then, then becomes the view that uh, you have no rights because I say you have no rights. The Bohemian Club was founded 120 years ago in San Francisco by a group of newspaper men, businessmen, and artists. Modern-day members include some of the most influential American men of the 20th century. President Bush is a member, along with former President Ronald Reagan. Also, past secretaries of state George Shultz and Henry Kissinger. What's unique about the San Francisco Bohemian Club is they have a, a private retreat, a 2,700-acre retreat, up on the Russian River in Sonoma County. This is an old-growth redwood forest with trees that are 300 feet tall, 1,500 years old, that they privately own. And this, this grove, every year, they have a summer encampment there in late July and early August that runs two weeks and three weekends. And they'll invite several hundred people to come from all over the world, other men, because this is men's, men only there, from all over the world. The Bohemian Grove is extremely tight. It's almost as if there were a military installation down there. Everything is kept under wraps, and in this case, under the tree. They kicked off their retreat with a spectacular nighttime ceremony. From the air, the encampment is lit up with torches. Suddenly, the night is ablaze as robed men begin the cremation of care, a ritual that symbolizes the shedding of the burdensome responsibilities of the outside world. Such allegations about the camp have angered many who feel that leaders who adamantly embrace traditional values are not what they appear to be. Conversation at that level is all off the record. There's no press involved, so it's like the men are getting uh, kind of a first-hand understanding. It may not be any big trade secrets or anything, but they're getting this kind of off-the-record understanding of the way things are, or the way things should be. And I think this certainly gives them an advantage in the world, in the economic world, because, you know, they know what the directions are, what the uh, movers and shakers are thinking, and um, what some of the major policy considerations that are being considered, um, the directions that they're moving in. Excuse me? This is a private club. You're not supposed to be here at all. And it's going to be So what's happening? You want to film this guy? Yeah. Did you film him already? Uh, I'm sorry, where's your property line? I'm not sure. Where's the property line? I'm not sure. Oh, no, this is a public street, right? Right here? The uh, crosswalk? Oh, that's fine. Move. Let's you understand, move? You're not very late to your private property. This is private building, private sidewalk. The private sidewalk? Yes, sir. No way. I don't believe it. Hi. No, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with walking no, by. I think you retarded this one. I think you're retarded. I filmed this guy. I think you're very good. Well, okay. We got the hospitality, the negative hospitality of the San Francisco Bohemian Club. <laughs> There have been cases where people have written about the club and uh, or snuck in. Um, uh, Dirk Matheson from People Magazine stuck, snuck in um, and was actually spotted by a, by a Time Warner executive and expelled from 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 the club. Uh, I mean, from the Grove. And um, he, in fact, lost his job six months later. Although they they claim that it wasn't related to that, that um, it was certainly a coincidental.
de volgende beelden zijn zeldzaam. Leden van de Bilderberggroep komen aan bij de jaarlijkse bijeenkomst. Ditmaal in Londen. Hier is te zien hoe journalisten ongehinderd vragen kunnen stellen aan deelnemers. Tegenwoordig is dat ondenkbaar, omdat de bijeenkomsten niet meer van tevoren worden aangekondigd en de media zorgvuldig op een afstand worden gehouden. Well, the Skull and Bones is less important than it used to be. It's, it, the heyday has passed, but its idea uh, has continued into other organizations, including the Bilderbergers, which I, I, it was founded in Holland, which is an international um, uh, meeting, meeting of, of prominent, powerful people. Um, they are somewhat like the Skull and Bones because they, they want to be secretive. Now, the, new, the media won't let them alone to some extent. They're trying to find out. But the, by itself, the, the Bilderbergers will not publish a list of uh, the, where they're meeting, who they're meeting, and what they're discussing. They never publish what they discuss. So in that sense, there's a great commonality between the idea behind Skull and Bones and the idea between the Bilderbergers. The difference, of course, is that they haven't taken oaths and they don't operate in cells, I suppose, the membership changes. But the key point is that these people want to keep what they're doing to themselves, and yet at the same time they call themselves public servants and presumably are, um, are, um, are, um, owe at least openness to the people who put them there to, to, to the electorate. This is where they met at the Badescherhof hotel in Baden-Baden, Germany. Normally they meet in remote areas, but this was a downtown hotel. Bilderbergs are pulling in, the guards are keeping people away. It was at Baden-Baden, incidentally, where an obscure governor of Arkansas named Bill Clinton first attended a Bilderberg meeting. For years he had been a member of their junior varsity, the Trilateral Commission, which is somewhat more public. So we predicted at the time there'd be a a fine political future for our young Governor Bill Clinton of Arkansas, who is not known to the public at large or to the nation at large at all at that time. The Bilderberg Group werd opgericht in 1954 door Prins Bernhard. Dit zijn beelden uit de tijd dat Bernhard en Beatrix nog in alle openheid de Bilderberg bijeenkomsten bezochten. Ze nemen de vier vijf tot op het vier. Er zijn een aantal belangrijke mensen, invloedrijke mensen uit om deel te nemen aan de Bilderberg bijeenkomsten. Wat eigenlijk wil je ermee bereiken? Dat is moeilijk te zeggen. Ik uh, ik de mensen bij elkaar brengen. En dat hebben we toen gedaan op de Bilderberg de eerste keer. En dat bleek zo'n succes. En uh, we hadden echt uh, hard met hard tegen elkaar gepraat door deze mensen. En, uh, it was not until 1975 when I came to the spotlight and they talked about Bilderberg that I even knew they existed. I said, this is not possible. I've spent 20 years poring over the AP wires, reading my own newspaper and reading everybody else's newspaper. It's not possible for this to be taking place without newspapers giving it attention. And since that time, I've done my best to give it a great deal of attention. It is not conspiracy. It is conspiracy in a legal sense, but not in a sociological sense. These people don't sit down and plan. They know what to do instinctively. They all think the same. They're educated the same. They know the same things. They respond to the same uh, stimulants. Their money, power, brotherhood. You don't need. You don't need a telephone call. You know what to do. So, uh, but until you get right into it, I suppose you do see. Uh, you know, people smoking in a smoke-filled room and planning everything they do. I don't think they operate that way. They know what to do. I think it's a matter of influence. People, what do they say? To go along, uh, to get along, you've got to go along. Most people want to, 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 to get along, to, to, to gain power and uh, prestige. And they know the way to do that is to listen to the guy above you. So if uh, someone, say, in Skull and Bones calls um, people he knows, and these people know what the power of skull and bones. 
It, all it takes is a hint or a suggestion. And a uh, policy can be implemented or killed. You will never read about Bilderberg in the Washington Post or the New York Times and other establishment American newspapers for one reason. Catherine Graham, Mrs. Graham, chairman of the Washington Post, has attended Bilderberg meetings for years. Also, high officials of the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, the News Weekly, and uh, television news, network television news actsmen attend these meetings. They do so on their solemn promise to report nothing, not use that word Bilderberg in their newspapers. To me, they are journalistic prostitutes. How in the world do you attend such a momentous meeting and cover it up? Now, while Bilderberg meetings were systematically suppressed in the United States except for Spotlight, not too in Canada, where our readers there alerted the newspapers to the uh, meeting of Bilderberg last spring in King City. Here we have a list, partial list of participants of this heavy story that jumps. We have uh, photographs of Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller, Queen Beatrix, all of whom attended the meeting. The idea of sky bonds has continued, but I think it's much harder to implement because the United States is much larger. It's much more diverse. The, the, the multinational corporations, the, uh, the banks, overseas interests, the foreign communities in the United States, all these are now beginning to play into policy. It would be much more difficult for a group like Scar and Bones to control today. A hundred years ago, it was homogeneous. It was a white Anglo-Saxon banking interest or corporate culture. You could control that to maybe 20 or 30 members, but not today. It's too diverse. So I see New World Order as being a multinational corporate control operating through the corporations um, to bring about economic control, financial control, and uh, the political and the educational and the sociological aspects are subsidiary. Uh, this I find very dangerous because you're getting very, very close to the Nazi ideal, and because fascism, after all, is, is, is an organization where business controls the government. As you see, uh, as we, we talked about earlier, uh, Hitler was financed essentially by businessmen. And businessmen like, in fact, have to have governments under their control. They don't like free enterprise, and here you've got to make a distinction between free enterprise and capitalism. I will support free enterprise, I believe in free enterprise, the individual making his own way through business. This is essential. It's the most efficient way to do well in economic society. But capitalism is where a group or a corporation wants to monopolize, and it's the word monopoly that's essential here. They want the world monopoly, which is not free enterprise. That's, that's capitalism almost in a sense. It's, it's world monopoly they want. That, that is the core of the world order. Going on today is one of a number of groups. It happens to be now a semi-secret semi group. If this is one secret organization, and I was fortunate enough to get the membership list, how do I know or anybody know there are not other secret groups where I have not or nobody else has had the membership list? So we also have to take the hypothesis in mind that there could be other groups which are truly secret. Nobody is aware of the existence which have this, which have this uh, ultimate purpose.